you how to do that. Um, yep. We brought a customer, a partner actually, um, who has been deploying Drupal for many, many years um, from everybody from, I heard, Time and all kinds of amazing, huge sites. Yeah, Zagat. Uh, we did the Thomson Reuters Olympic site for 2013. We worked on a certain house that is white in uh, Washington, D.C.'s website. So, mm -hmm. so the, the thing about what we do is we do all of our stuff in open source. So the code that we are going to show you today, just like Drupal, is all open source. So it's freely available for you to use um, either in a hosted public environment or a private cloud environment. So I'm, I'm just going to go through these pretty quick. I'll use the right arrows. So we are um, a platform as a service offering from Red Hat, which is a large Linux um, distributor. Uh, many people know us for that. Um, and most of the, oops, ex allow. Whoops, I'm having fun with this. You can use the arrow keys too. Yeah, I just want to get rid of that little thing on the top. There we go, time's out. So almost all of the clouds that are out there right now are built on top of Linux. So the only one that I know of, a big public cloud that isn't, is Win um, Windows Azure cloud. So almost everybody is using Linux. Um, most of the big ones are using um, Red Hat Linux under the hood. So we have lots of experience building um, clouds for people, big infrastructure clouds. Um, but we have lots of different projects. I think there are over 10, 100,000 open source projects that Red Hat sponsors and has people working on. So we're very much about open source and making software freely available. So one of those projects is a little one that I work on. The one on the bottom is called OpenShift Origin. And that is the platform as a service that deploys Drupal. And that's what we're, we're here, all here happy about today. Um, I'm going to skip through this. So when you look at a cloud, right, you, um, when you build a cloud, you have the infrastructure layer, which is all the servers up there in the sky and elastic so they expand and contract. So that's the infrastructure as a service layer. And then there's the platform as a service, which is deploying the LAMP stack. And then there's the SaaS layer, which is the Drupal site. So that's the, the top piece. So basically what you get with the infrastructure is just the network, the storage, and the compute resources. And with the SaaS, you get your application. So you get your Drupal, or you get your um, Python and Django, or you get some other tools that you have, or maybe you're using um, salesforce.com, you get that thing. And that's really what all the user cares about. They don't care about the stuff in the middle. And that's what we make sure that we deliver with platform as a service. It's all the runtime environments that you need whether it's Apache Tommy, um, Nginx, whether it's um, making sure you have the right version of uh, PHP, um, the ability to run Drush inside the container, MySQL, maybe you're using MariaDB, which is the new version of MySQL. Um, we make sure that we configure and stand up that Drupal instance for you and do it in an automated way that you can then auto scale into the cloud. So that's really the role that platform as a service is. And so OpenShift is the name of a platform as a service offering from Red Hat um, with many community members. Um, and what we do is we put the middle of the cake in there. So today we're here talking to people about Drupal, but we also support lots of other languages and um, do all the magic behind the scenes for that. So there are three flavors of OpenShift. Um, and all those three flavors um, derived from the first one, the OpenShift pro open source project, which is Origin. Um, and we use the Origin code base to host a public cloud. Um, so you can go to, and if you come to the table afterwards, we'll give you a free account to play with. Um, that is the actual production account that you can have forever um, with three, one, gig one gigabyte instances with a half a gig of memory. And then you can host there for free forever. It's a great way to try it because the user experience that you see in the public cloud is exactly the same one that you get when you install the software on your own cloud, whether it's a private cloud or not. So if you sign up for that. And then um, Red Hat also has OpenShift Enterprise, which is the enterprise offering for private cloud people. So a government agency might want to have it hosted behind their firewall, all of the 
the open shift stuff, so you could do it that way. So I mentioned open shift online. If you come to the booth afterwards or after we're done talking, I will show you how to sign up and get an account at openshift.com. And that's the look and feel is pretty much the same. Um, we're not the only ones that are using it. There are a number of other clouds that are offering OpenShift. So you can go, um, they've taken the open source code and put it um, and created an, their own public platform as a service offering at GetUp Cloud. There's one other one that um, in Europe that's just about to announce. Um, lots of people use it. Tons of customers and clients um, are using it. So it's very, um, very easy to deploy. We have all the puppet scripts and everything. So if you want to run your own private pods, you can, or you can use our hosting service. Or you can ask if you have a preferred hosting provider, so someone that um, the Atom for Peace people want to work with, you can ask them to install OpenShift and run it there. So there's, there's lots of options. Um, everything is in GitHub. So if you want anything from GitHub, all of this code is there. Um, the things that make it different is that this is a super secure um, platform as a service. So it's using secure Linux, uh, SE Linux, for the containers that Drupal runs inside of. So they're, it's basically an unbreakable container. Someone couldn't hack into it and change it to uh, peace for atoms instead of atoms for peace. You know, they couldn't, you, the container that you're in is super secure. We have a lot of government agencies in the United States that are using RHEL and using OpenShift. So, it, I, I keep emphasizing this, it is open source, just like Drupal is open source, um, and you can take it and use it and fork it, and if you wanted your own flavor of it, you could do that as well. So for um, government agencies, sometimes they have special things that they want to do, and they need to make it a, a fork of it, and we help them do that. And we also help them merge it back in. So we work with a very big community of people um, from the Drupal community, we're working with Stephen Merrill, who is um, going to come up now, and he's going to show you how it works, because he's um, a Drupal expert, and I am a bit of a pause expert. So I'm going to switch to yours. If you have any, I don't, I really don't mind talking about it. Sure, so as Diane mentioned, uh, my name's Stephen Merrill. I do a lot of work with Drupal at phase two. We've done lots of big sites, and OpenShift is really interesting to me for a number of reasons. I have a presentation, but I think I'm going to skip some of it because a lot of it goes pretty deep. Um, but I did want to talk about, yeah, so with OpenShift, you know, Diane mentioned there's OpenShift Online, which is for free, three apps. Try it out. If you just want to try out Drupal 8 today, you can do that. If you want to try out Drupal 7, you can do that. Um, this is from my other one. I said, Dobre Oproten, Guten Tag, for everyone who is there. Um, so I'm a director of engineering at phase two. And we helped to build a Drupal 8 quick start for OpenShift Online. Basically, uh, when I first came to OpenShift, uh, to use OpenShift and to learn about it. It was about maybe four months ago, and there was a Drupal 7 quick start, and Diane had said, we want people to be able to try Drupal 8 on OpenShift Online. And so we met at the Red Hat Community Summit in Boston, and Diane had it almost working, and she just asked me if I could do it, and I said, sure. Um, and I may skip some of this, but the thing with OpenShift is that it comes with a ton of different languages and frameworks. There's PHP 5.3, there's Ruby 1.8, Ruby 1.9, Python 2.6, 2.7, and 3.3, Perl, Java with the JBoss app server. Yeah, basically anything you want. You've got Postgres, MySQL, MongoDB, uh, and Node.js. So lots of stuff. Uh, there's a cron cartridge. There's Jenkins if you want to build server for your tools as well. So that's what comes with it. But then there's also a ton of stuff that you can make uh, or you can use from the community. So basically, I'll talk about this in a bit, but anything that runs on Red Hat or Fedora, you can probably make work on OpenShift as well because you know the boxes that run this are Red Hat Enterprise Linux boxes. So in the case of Drupal 8, we had a little bit of an issue in that Drupal 8 requires PHP 5.3.5, and RHEL typically keeps a single version and keeps backporting security fixes. So you know, OpenShift Online runs RHEL 6.4, which has PHP 5.3.3. And so when we looked at that, we said, nope, that's not gonna work. Um, so my task of getting Drupal 8 to install on OpenShift got a little more complex. Uh, but luckily we could do that. I'm probably gonna skip over some of this since uh, you know, we don't have to do a deep dive into this. But the, the gist of it is that if something runs on RHEL or Fedora, as I said, it'll, it'll run on OpenShift. So for example, in this case, I was looking for 
someplace where I could get PHP 5.4 so that we could get it running on OpenShift. And there's a repository called IUS, uh, maintained by Rackspace, that has PHP 5.3 and 5.4 RPMs for RHEL. Uh, and so luckily I could just take those RPMs, grab the binaries out, and make a cartridge. Um, so I'll skip through the nitty gritty. Basically, there's a tool that you can use on Linux to sort of rip the binaries and the files out of these RPM packages. Um, and I'll, I'll have all the links here and I'll post this online later. But suffice it to say, I'm gonna skip through most of this because it's very, very deep on how to create a cartridge. Uh, so we'll go through that. But yeah, once you've made your own cartridge, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. So, you know, once you've said, I have my PHP 5.4 cartridge, if you decide I really need to have, like, do you have another application you might want to host on OpenShift? Sorry. Sure. I mean, there's already quite a few that are, you know, you can run WordPress, you can run Drupal, you can run Jenkins, you can run Joomla. There's, there's quick starts for a lot of these. But if you make your own, it's actually pretty easy to go through and do this too, where you can go through and take something that's on GitHub and then just put it as a cartridge on OpenShift. So I'd actually like to show that. Diane also mentioned how OpenShift is completely open source, right? There's OpenShift Origin, which is the online, uh, sorry, which is the sort of top level open source project. And then there's their hosted online version and the enterprise version. So what I did was I took OpenShift Origin and I installed it on a VPS running in Amsterdam. So this is literally, took me about 10 minutes. Um, there's a good puppet script for installing this and there's going to be more support for different installers coming down the pipe too. I think someone's built one with Ansible. And this is running on DigitalOcean. Yeah, so this is running on DigitalOcean, who's a VPS provider in Amsterdam. I spun it up on Sunday for uh, my talk at the community day. And so you can see, you know, every part of it is open source. Uh, and in this case, I'm actually just running it on a single machine, but I've got the broker here and I already logged in as my user. So I already have two apps here. I've got the Jenkins app. and. I don't want to understate how great it is to have Jenkins uh, here. So Jenkins, you know, is a build server. It runs on OpenShift Origin. It also runs on OpenShift Online. In a couple cases, we've had our customers sign up for OpenShift Online Silver, which is the plan where you can get up to six gigabytes of space and you can use bigger gears. And we're actually using the OpenShift Jenkins server alongside a project that's hosted on Acquia. So we can do all of our builds, you know, compiling of SAS or Compass, things like that, because no, you know, you can set up an app to say this is a PHP app, or this is a Ruby app, or this is a Python app, but all the boxes have all the machines installed. So your Jenkins server also has PHP, and it has Ruby, and it has Python. So if your build script needs to use that kind of stuff, you can do it, and that's really great. There are other Jenkins platform as a service offerings like CloudBees, but they don't have PHP or Ruby or Python. So it's really neat to have a, a platform like this that just has it included. And you can also, in any app that you have, add Jenkins builds to it. So I'll show you the default workflow for working with OpenShift in a little while. But, and it does have its own built-in sort of Git-based deployment mechanism. You get a repository for every project so that you can easily, you know, if you want to make a copy of an app, you can actually just make a new one, push the same Git repository to it, and you have a second one. So actually with that said, let's go through and just create an application. So this is my you know, copy of OpenShift Origin. And this is more or less what it looks like out of the box. This is running on CentOS 6.4. So running on a, you know, the open source clone of RHEL 6.4. It also runs on Fedora. And most of the stuff comes out of the box. So I could make a PHP app if I wanted to. And it's a little tough to see, but there's two different things, sets of things that are installed. There's the cartridges themselves, you know, so PHP 5.3, you can't really see it, but that's a cartridge. Ruby 1.9 is a cartridge. Ruby 1.8 is a cartridge. And then there's also some quick starts. And these are recipes that make it really easy to get up and running with a particular thing. And I took, uh, there's just a file on the console here that I can edit and say, I want to make extra quick starts available. So I made this Drupal 7 quick start available, for example. So I'm going to say, great, I want to use the Drupal quick start. We will call this Drupal 7. Uh, and every user on OpenShift gets their own kind of namespace. It's hard to see, but mine is community here. So you can have different users too. You could say, each developer in my organization can launch five apps. Uh, and OpenShift also supports different gear sizes. So you could have like some very powerful servers where you ran large gears that had a lot of RAM and a lot of CPU. Maybe for developers, you give them small gears that have just a little bit of RAM and a little bit of CPU. Uh, you can also do disk quotas, so you could say like, you know, certain of my developers get one gig, certain of them get six gigs, that's exactly how online works. And more or less, all this quick start is going to do is it's going to start from a particular Git repository. So I've already got a quick start here for Drupal 7, I'm just going to hit create here. 
I'll, I'll also note here that there is a scaling option. One of the other cool things about OpenShift is that it can automatically scale your applications for you. So you can go in and say, I have a PHP application with a MySQL database. And what it'll do is it'll put MySQL on its own gear and PHP on a separate gear. And then if a lot of requests start coming in, it'll automatically scale up and add PHP gears as you need capacity. So that's another really great thing is that it'll do that. And then you know as your app scales up, when you do deploys, it'll send the code to each of your gears and restart them. So that's another great thing. You can either have it automatically scale or you can just set it to a certain threshold. You can say, I need a minimum of three PHP gears and a maximum of five. So if you know, you know you've got a high traffic event coming up, you can actually tell the system to say, I need you to scale to this certain amount, but still have some headroom to go. So that's another really neat thing that you know, OpenShift sort of takes care of for you. And so I started up my Drupal 7 app, and if I just click over to here, we've got a Drupal 7 site. Um, I didn't select scaling, so this is all on one gear. So it's got PHP, Drush, MySQL, and the cron cartridge as well to, do, to run Drupal cron every hour. Uh, I can log into my site. And then just to show you how, uh, how OpenShift's Git repository setup works, when you first create your application, it shows you the path to the Git repository, and every application gets a Git repository. So I could copy this and go into my command line and just say git clone, and it's gonna clone that down from the server. And just to show what the deployment looks like, I'm gonna CD into the directory with Drupal 7. So you can see I've got regular Drupal 7. And let's say I wanted to make a change, so I'm gonna edit themes, bardic, CSS, style.css. And because the official color of OpenShift is red, I'm gonna make all the headings red, let's say. Great. So I have my change. Look at me trying to get too fancy. All right, there we go. So I have my commit. I'll do a git push. And then it'll just restart the application. So it receives the Git, it restarts Apache. And now if I go and reload my Drupal 7 app, then, oh, I did background color instead of color. Well, you know, whatever. It's very easy to fix, you know. I can change background color to color. Push it back up, it's gonna restart it. There we go. Yep, and there we go. So now we have red headers up there. Uh, some other things that OpenShift gives you out of the box, I mentioned it has Jenkins, it will let you build your applications from Jenkins, it has scaling built in, it has SE Linux controls so that you know all the applications are isolated from one another. Some of the other things that we've been working on are that cartridges can also put things into a user's path. So what we've done for our Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 cartridges uh, in conjunction with some of the team like Wojtek here who works on the PHP cartridge is that we've made it so that you know just like developers are used to, they wanna have Drush when they're working with their app, right? So OpenShift also lets you have console access to your apps. It's, it's pretty locked down, but um, so I could get that from the console up there or also note that uh, OpenShift has a command line app called RHC, and you can use RHC to log into OpenShift online. You can use it to log into your origin server. So I'm gonna just go in here and I've made a special RHC 003 that just talks to my OpenShift box. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. You can just say 003 apps and it'll give you a list of all your apps. So we could take a look and see that, for example, our Drupal 7 app here uh, has one gear. This is the Git URL. It's using our PHP 5.4 and our MySQL 5.1 as gears. Uh, then I could also do an RHC SSH to Drupal 7. And this just connects me into my gear. So I'm here and now I could say, you know, drush CC all, for example. Great. And so it, it went through and cleared my cache. Or I could say, oh, let's say I wanted to download a module maybe. Uh, what's a good module to download? Is there a place kit in module? Oh, man. 
Yeah, or panels. Let's say we're going to do a bunch of stuff on our site. We're going to download panels or views maybe. Great. So it downloaded that for me. I could do a drush en panels to enable the panels modules. It tells me I need the ctools module. Great. It's going to enable a bunch of stuff. Awesome. So I have ctools and panels on my site. And now if I go through and I go to the modules page, You've got panels. So yeah, it, you know, it works with Drupal very well. It, it works with Drush out of the box with our both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 quick starts. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, so this is all on origin, but we also wanted to make sure that as a great first test, people could try out Drupal 8 just to see how it's working. Uh, and I have to make sure I actually have an, uh, a slot available, but if you just go to openshift.com slash quick starts. Oops, that is a link right into my quick start. Um, there's a whole list of all sorts of things that are available to run on OpenShift Online today. So openshift.com slash quick starts. You can see, for example, OwnCloud. Uh, they gave a demo on Sunday. They're an app that kind of aims to give you your entire own personal cloud. So you can have your own Dropbox-like storage and your own, I think, calendar sync and lots of other things like that. And so it's a PHP app and it, and it works on OpenShift. Uh, the OpenShift team maintains the WordPress quick start, the Ruby on Rails quick start. Um, there's some interesting new ones that are coming up here, like the Go language. So that's another example of something that isn't a native uh, capability of the OpenShift platform, but someone just grabbed a binary of Go and made it so that you can run Go apps on OpenShift. And that's really, I think, that's the really attractive thing to me is that OpenShift provides all this infrastructure to let people spin up apps, to do scaling. There's a snapshotting and backup component. So like if you're running with MySQL, you can say RHC snapshot and it'll give you a database backup. Uh, but then, yeah, literally anything that will run on RHEL or Fedora, you can make run on here. And so, of course, the thing that we'll probably want to go to, looks like it dropped off the front page, but there is also our Drupal 8 quick start. And I can hit deploy now on this. That's going to take me to OpenShift Online. Maybe. I might have all three already. We'll have to see. Okay, so we can get rid of Drupal 8 too here. So this is the same UI that you see if you log into yourself to deploy to Drupal. And yep. Whether you put it on your own private cloud or you have it in um, use my public cloud version or a hosted one on some private cloud for some managed service provider that you wanted to use it with. Yep, so just to compare and contrast, there's only a tiny bit of branding taken out. So this is OpenShift. It's okay. This is OpenShift Online, and that's Origin. Literally, just a couple small changes. And of course, you could also go through and add the CSS to this. the The console here is a Rails application. So if you wanted to, you know, put your own branding on this when you're running it inside your firewall or on some other service provider, you can absolutely do that. Ah, so I got distracted. We need to go and spin up our quick start now. So when you click on one of those, it actually just takes the quick start and lets you know. And so just to show you again, you know, each user on the system gets their own prefix. And the reason that they do this is that you have your app name dash your prefix. That means you can have one wildcard SSL certificate and it works for all the machines. But you can also alias other things in. So if I make my Drupal 8 site and then I decide that I also want it to respond to Drupal 8.phase2technology.com, you can do that. So you can also add in names so you're not always using just the one domain name. But by default, for OpenShift Online, it'll be rhcloud.com. For your own, it can be whatever you want. So let me get this spinning up, because Drupal 8 still takes a little while to install since it's in development mode. So we'll create our application. Oh, I already have an app named Drupal 8. Well, of course I do. Yep, so we'll create this. And like I said, yeah, this will take a while. The, the optimization of Drupal 8 is not yet complete. Um, any other stuff that I should talk about uh, on online or origin? So uh, I, there's a couple of other gentlemen in the room as well, but I think if, if you were, are you, are you planning with Atoms for Peace to um, just deploy it? Have you deployed any Drupal yet today? No, 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 no. We had the Ruby on Rails and we put it into uh, the implementation. Um, and uh, it's currently in the cloud, like the uh, console. So, yeah. so as much as uh, currently not uh, 
basically see the Drupal admin page. So, um, and if you have a sysadmin that you work with that will help you, you know, do the cron, set up the cron jobs and all that, you you can just SSH in and, and set all of that up for yourself. Right. Right? Yeah, I have two really good questions about it. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the thing that you'd have to do with that is, again, every app gets its own Git repository. So if you have your Git repository, you know, you could you deploy it back. You know, yeah, and that's actually how you could push things ahead is, you know, let's say you had a dev, test, and prod version. Yeah, you just say when you've got some changes ready to go, you push that to test. They go up there. Um, yep, and then the other thing that you might need to do would be, like for example, you might at some point need to grab a database and pull it back from test into, into dev. And the RHC tools also let you do a reverse proxy so you can connect to that database locally and like restore a newer snapshot if you want. And we're also doing some work. Drush can support remote aliases. So we're actually doing some work to see if we can't get it so that you could grab Drush aliases for all your OpenShift gears. And then with that, you could just do a you know, Drush at test, at dev, SQL sync to sync the database from the test instance to the dev instance. Yep, and actually, let's see if we, this does take a while to install, so hopefully it's done. Go Drupal 8. <laughs> There's Drupal 8. There are lots of bugs in Drupal 8 right now. Um, <laughs> we just, we're doing some work in the sprint on it. And what, why will that hurt the instance? So we're doing everything uh, to the cloud to Drupal 7, right? And that's uh, the position I'm in. Uh, who's taking care of the Drupal 7 stuff and like core? Is there a new patch? Is there then? So we've actually been working on improving that. The, the older quick start and the one that's currently online just downloads whatever the latest snapshot is, isn't that what you get? But what we did recently, and I've been working with Wojtek to make this better, is to make it so that literally we could just have it cloned directly from Drupal.org, so you can just do a git pull and grab the latest version in. Um, or potentially use Drush to update it, to say Drush downloads, you know, 7.23 now, 7.24 is out, go and do that. But the quick starts uh, give you a git repo to start with. So like for the Drupal 7 quick start, we're actually, we've built a new one that we're gonna hopefully phase in pretty soon where it's literally, it's got the git history from Drupal.org. So you could literally just go, you know, git fetch d.o, that would pull in all the latest stuff for core. So um, what it is is an open source project. So you can take this 
same code that we use to run OpenShift online mm -hmm. and deploy it on Rackspace or on UpCloud in Finland or right. GetUpCloud. Right. And, there, right. and the same deployment, the same Git repository can get pushed um, to any anyone running OpenShift okay. anywhere. Okay. Um, we have a lot of customers that um, are running it in their private clouds behind firewalls of enterprise as a private cloud. Um, we have a lot of public clouds that are using it under the hood to um, you know, deliver platform as a service as an offering on their managed hosting services. So, um, and if you have a preferred provider um, that you want to work with in Africa or Europe, um, it's very easy for them to install. Um, we've got another, we can show you how to do that in about okay. 10 minutes with Puppet. Um, and they can, they can stand up an OpenShift um, cluster for you. Drupal is a community-based project that's sponsored by Red Hat, and um, we're, it, it's free. Okay. It's open source. So it means it's like the, the, the head project that we see. That's, that's the we, individual we, we, Yes, and it's worth noting, it, this does not require virtualization. So you can run this on bare metal, or you can run it on Rackspace, or EC2, or DigitalOcean, or whatever. It just needs to be able to run RHEL and have SE Linux enabled, or even for Origin, it could be Fedora or CentOS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all you need. You don't have to have OpenStack, you don't have to have some other kind of virtualization to run it. Okay. And that actually lets you get a performance increase too. If you actually can run it on bare metal, it's using containerization. So there's no sort of virtualization of the operating system. It's all just, there's one Apache process here running in a very specific SE Linux namespace that's you know cordoned off from the rest. Over here you might be running Nginx and PHP here. But yeah, it actually could let you get better density of your services too. So you don't have to virtualize the kernel, virtualize all the low level drivers, handle all of this. It's, it's running using, uh, containerization, SE Linux, LXC, and pretty soon it'll actually be interoperable with Docker as well. So you could run a Docker created image in your gears. That you know work is being done by like 15 members on the Red Hat team to bring Docker first to Fedora and then into RHEL. And that'll even open up you know the, the number of applications that you can run even further. So I think we're at the end of our yes, time. We need so to I'm actually going to go, I need to go to the, there's a Drupal integration. Go, go, for, go do it. What, um, what kind of um, access, what, what kind of Drupal sites are you building? We're building communication, uh, communication sites. So we, we have one for important Drupal. We're looking at the best way of starting from scratch with a technical infrastructure, uh, talk of the whole spectrum and upgrade and No worries at all. I'm not sure this, these folks want to hear about translation. Does anyone want to hear about translation? No, not really. Okay, that's all right. Um, not in the moment, but I'm sure we'll get to it. Hey, one night, one night is from Walk Talk, I guess. So basically, Lingo Tag has a secure module that helps um, um, to identify the node content. And the one right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you there. Uh, yeah, yeah. for cloud based translation and everything. So you can use actually.
project it up, make it easy for you guys. So if you go to
Yeah, could, this, could this start work, this a workflow to test yes. that? Here we have people making notes. It could be that the whole idea of having somebody who could do this, right. they participate earlier on by saying, hey, I observed the ABC run, uh, great so far, but like, make a few notes, and then before it then gets to their approval stage. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and then the, the excellent thing, this is also a big problem in translation, is that you know, people send over the source content to edit, or to I'm sorry, to translate, start translating and then they say, whoa, 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 we have a new version. Use this version instead, right? And so it, it doesn't matter really because we have the control versioning in here. And so because there's this thing called translation memory, which aligns all this stuff, all it's doing is saying, well, this stuff is already translated. So it does a matching algorithm mm -hmm. and applies the exact matches against that content and says, it's okay. You sort of you can begin translation at any point in time. Right. And then it applies these fast translations so you're not doing duplicate work. Says okay, here it is. Here are your source edits. This is what you need to translate. Mm -hmm. okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. a, so it's a it's a big problem. Um, you know, and especially here in Europe, it's like um, you know, almost every site's multilingual. And uh, I, I look at your card. Where, where do you work? Yeah, so I mean, inherently, you guys have to deal with all kinds of translation issues. And, um, and so what this does is it allows you to leverage machine translation, um, allows you to use your own in-house translators. I'm trying to do some views, any overflow with other translation agencies or professionals. question. So um, there, there, there's two different ways to approach it. But so what we, we the way we traditionally charge, right, is the contrib module is free, you can get free machine translation, export content, do this community translation stuff, but it doesn't allow you to access our translation management system and create custom workflows and upload your past translation links. Okay. If you want to do that, the way we charge is five thousand dollars per language pair. Twelve languages, you know, paying sixty thousand dollars a year. Now, if you wanted to, you know, and oftentimes like large organizations like you know, we work with a lot of government agencies in the U.S. Yes. Um, what we do is um, we sell them premise-based software, and then we do it on a user model, you know, which seems to be like people that like consistently work in there. They're not interested in language pairs as much as they are in like how many users do we have or translators right. do we have, and so we sell it on that basis to them. Right. So in the case of the machine translation or you could do your own, just your own translation, <coughs> just, okay. just using this workbench, right? But what you don't get is you don't get a sort of upload translation memory. So this is, uh, I don't see this, there's different translation resources covered up by the notes, but basically past translation show up. So like the machine learning, like people learn, it's all machine learning. learning.
See if I have a slide on this. This because this is just a workbench. Let me uh, find another slide. Yeah, I came back from the IAT conference really inspired. I, I kind of pitched it to the head of content. And he kind of said to me, We have people to do this. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, the, this, it's, a, it's a hard hurdle to clear to get, you know, get you guys to buy software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you get, what, you know, when people start to say, why would, I, why would I pay for it, is you get access to project management workflows. There's a whole project management engine. There's a whole workflow engine. You can literally create new workflows in here. You can, um, you know, you can manage all your translation memories. So... You know, inside now I'm just logged into the software, right? So I have a full dashboard. I have project management. I can create new projects, create new workflows. Um, you know, manage all my resources like past translation memories, glossaries, terminology. Um, you know, community stuff like I could, you know, set different thresholds for voting. I could embed certain things inside the CMS. Um, you know, if I do system maintenance, I mean, you literally get. Um, Machine translation engines, you can manage all the MT engines. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a big piece of software. You know, it's a little bit deceptive when you just see somebody like have a little editor. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like seeing the, the search engine. Exactly. It's, and, and that's sort of the point, right? You just go like, you're here, you're, you're translating. But if you're not the translator, what you're really doing is you're managing all this stuff. You're managing, you know, really the whole language system of the UN, you know, and you'd have access to all this stuff. I think from, from your perspective, if you're managing Drupal at the UN, you know, what you're really trying to do is say, get rid of all my BS tasks, and you know, my web admin tasks, which is just mind books, right? And you just pull that stuff in and put it to a trans translation interface like that. And when it's done, it's not like, here you go. It's like, there it went. I mean, it's already loaded. It's done, right? So you don't have to get involved. And your team doesn't have to get involved in any of that sort of So we literally have, and I'll, let me find a slide that's sort of cool on that. Um, bear with me. 
see if I can get any animation to work. So it has all this stuff, but. There we go. So it's animated. What it's trying to show here is that, so independent of the translation process, which is probably speaking more to you and your team, is there's all these elements, these blocks that are like project management and web administration that precede, you know, the translation process. In order for somebody to have the content, you have to identify it, you have to download it, you have to either export some stuff, you know, you have to do all these things. And so that's what the module does, right? Automates all that, you know, selection of content, bulk management, node, and, you know, all that stuff in. When you do that, it has the mapping that's inherently in the map back to the website, you know, once that translation is completed. So all that stuff is no longer, you know, your problem. Yeah. It's your problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in our case, we're, we're working closely with the content team and see how we can best help them get their job done with minimal movement. Mm -hmm. So it's not really our domain to be offering advice and counseling to people, but we're offering them tools to help them do their job. And that's about as much as we're going to really get with the way we construct the manual to put this together. Yep. Um, yeah, there's, uh, we're, we're working on Drupal 8 right now. So we have Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. The Drupal 7 one's much, much better. Yeah. But, um, Drupal 